Hi, this is Miss Slidden, and this is seventh period support. Hi. For uh, our unit one exam. Say hi. Hi. All right, so we're going to go through reviewing these three chapters as well as our lab, because that's on the test as well. Okay, so we'll start with chapter 33, and we'll do 34, 35, and I'll hit these main things. So I just took a, a I did this, and then here's just chapter 33 pulled out, so we can go through it. Okay, so the key points. I'm, obviously, I can't hit everything, but I'm hitting the key points for each of these chapters. The first one is I would know the definition of ecology because that's what this whole unit is about, right? If I have a group of the same species living in an area, I would call that a population. When I have more than one population interacting together, that's called a community, population, community, right? I put in the rain and the water, it's called a ecosystem. And then we talked about localized areas are called biomes, and then where all living things exist, we call that the biosphere. Go that, through that with me a little bit. You're either typing, trying to get on some group share notes. Do you need another minute, or are you okay? Okay, so let's go through it together. Population, several populations build a community, more than one species. Bringing in the environment is a ecosystem, and then where all living things exist is the biosphere. When we're studying ecology, we're looking at the way organisms interact with their what? Environment and each other, right? That's ecology. So then we said, let's start with population first. So we talked about two different types of growth curves. What were the names of those two growth curves? You know what they are? Exponential. What did that look like if you were going to give me a letter? J. J, good. And what kind of organisms are in those J-shaped growth curves? Insects. Like insects, so they are small, right? Insects, they are small. Do they have a lot of babies or just a few babies? A lot. They have a lot of babies, okay? That may be one way we could think about them. They are eat and drink because tomorrow we might die. That's right. What's the next kind of one called? What's the letter? S. S. Okay, oh, I don't like that. S. Okay, and what do they hover at? The carrying capacity. At the carrying capacity. And what kind of growth curve? This is an S, and this one was called a J. And um, what kind of growth curve is this? Logistic. Okay, and what kind of, give me an animal. An elephant. An elephant. And they don't tend to be small, they tend to be large. large. And they tend to have few babies, if we were going to relate them, okay? Um, and when they are hovering at that carrying capacity, what kind of things regulate them that keep them right at that carrying capacity? Share with the person next to you. What kind of things regulate them? What do we call that? Okay, now tell me. It starts with a D. Huh. Yes, boom shagalaga. Density what? Dependent, right? Density dependent. The numbers matter, right? Things like competition are going to regulate them. Um, trying to get mates, trying to get food. That's what keeps them hovering right at their carrying capacity. They're competing with one another. Whereas on the J-shaped growth curve, what are they regulated by? Density independent, exactly. What's an example of a density independent variable? Yes. Abiotic. Abiotic, I love it. Abiotic. Things like the what? Weather, drought, rainstorms, they don't know what's going to happen, so they just exploit the environment that they have right here, right now. Okay, so we talked about the two kinds of growth curves, R versus K. Which one would this one be? This would be the what? What would you call this one? R, and this one is the K. Okay. Um, so R, do you remember when we talked about opportunistic? 
right? Which ones are opportunistic, the R or the K? R. R. So these would be usually the opportunistic. We can put like everything on here. Whereas these are more what? Do you remember what these were? <coughs> equilibrium. Do you remember that one where we compared and contrasted? Remember the equilibrium one? We had the monkeys in the hot water and they're competing. But remember I had cockroaches for the opportunistic? Do you remember that, that diagram? Okay. So types of growth curves, R versus K. Regulation, we did density independent, density dependent. Okay, we talked about biotic potential. Biotic potential is your maximum number of offspring, right? So we talked about what kind of things could affect biotic potential. Do you remember what those are? Yes. The highest possible growth rate. Yeah, your highest possible growth rate. So but remember we said it's, when, yes? Uh, number of times it reproduces. Number of times you reproduce. So how often you reproduce. The first time you start reproducing? How many? How many offspring you have? Anything else? Yes. I don't Ch care. Chance of survival. Chance of survival until you can reproduce again. That's your biotic potential. You tend to see larger numbers here with the R, right? And you, uh, you tend to see um, smaller numbers here with the K or equilibrium. And then that brings us to these survivorship curves. So survivorship curves, if I was gonna keep this all on one document, they always start here at like a thousand. And do you remember how they kind of go? And then there's, and there's this, okay? What type is that right there? One, and this is two, and this is three. And if I was gonna put a survivorship curve number on the logistic growth curve, what do they tend to be? What kind of survivorship curves do they have? Yeah, they're gonna be your ones to twos, and what are these gonna be? Yeah, these are gonna be your twos to threes, primarily threes, right? And survivorship curve, you're saying, let's say, if you are a plant, you could produce thousands and thousands and thousands of seeds. Okay, and you produce all of these seeds, but you know not all of them will find ground where good soil for them to develop in. So that's more on the three, where most of your offspring die. Most of your offspring die. Very few make it to their, to their um, lifespan. Type one would be more like us. We will have so, you know, a few babies, but we're assuming we're going to keep both those babies. If you had two children, you're pretty much planning on keeping both those children alive, right, until the end of their lifespan. And then you have some that are in between, that their death is not a factor so much of their age, but some other thing in their environment. Okay, so those are your survivorship curves. Okay, questions, concerns so far? Okay. So then the next thing we want to talk about is habitat versus niche. Habitat is where you live. Niche is what you do. Okay? So you could have one habitat that has 100 different niches within that habitat. right? All doing a different job. All having a different role. But we do know something. We do know organisms don't want to wait. They want to decrease competition. And there's something called the competitive, what? Exclusion. Exclusion principle. Which says no two species can occupy the exact same niche for very long. Something's gonna happen. One's gonna live, one's gonna die. Or they're gonna take that niche and they're gonna figure out a way to share it in some way. They're gonna figure out a way to share that niche. And when they share that niche, that's called resource partitioning. Resource partitioning. I'll live on the top of the leaves, you live on the bottom of the leaves. I'll live towards closer to shore on the rocks, you li live farther from shore. I'll eat um, the bugs on the leaves, um, I'll eat the flowers. Okay, that is resource partitioning which decreases the amount of competition that you have to have, okay? So habitat versus niche, competitive exclusion principle. 
All right, human age structure diagrams. Remember how we watched that video like, oh my gosh, is the population going to explode and we're going to be overrun um, by poor third world countries, okay? Do you remember the three different age structure diagrams we looked at? Can I erase this or do you need this? Okay, I'll get you a new page. Okay, age structure diagrams. Do you remember the different ones? Right? These are the two big ones, right? And then each one age structure diagram was divided into three. Remember, if you say this is the time when you're being reproductive, is this middle one, then this one would be post, repro, and what would this be? Pre-reproductive. Right? And when you have an age structure diagram that looks like this, is this a more developed country or a less developed country? Less, less developed country, okay? And what you're concerned about here is all of these that are in the, if there's more in the pre-reproductive than in reproductive, when all these pre-reproductives move into the reproductive, there's gonna be even more of them, so they're gonna have even more what? Offspring and even more offspring, so what's gonna happen to that population size? It's gonna what? Grow, okay? Where this is more, you would see this in a more developed country where your age structure diagrams are more stable. And what we learned is if we wanna move, if we wanna move countries from a, um, an unstable to a stable age structure diagram, what do we need to give them in order to do that? We need food. What do we need? Medicine. We need, definitely, we need education. Yeah, that's what's going to help them move to a, a more stable age structure diagram. All right. Going back here, we've done survivorship curves, habitat, humans, age structure. Okay. Predator prey. Okay. So we looked at predator-prey diagrams where we said that there was a cycling between the predator and prey, right? As the prey numbers go up, then the predator numbers go up. And, as the, and then as the predator numbers go up, then what happens to the prey numbers? They go down, and it cycles. So organisms are always trying to be worse prey or, conversely, better what? Predators, better predators, right? So in order to do that, sometimes prey or predators will figure out a way to what? Hide, remember that? We looked at camouflage and we looked at, and, and you can hide and maybe you can look like a rock. Um, maybe you can look like you blend into the color of the flower. Remember the yellow spider? How you did, we didn't even see the yellow spider. Do you remember that on the daisy? Then we looked at different types of mimicry. Remember Batesian and Malarian mimicry. Which one is the liar? Which one is Pantalonis in Fuego? Tell me, Batesian. You're trying to get him to take the bait. That's when a fly is trying to look like a spider, right? Or a beetle is trying to look like a bee. That's Batesian mimicry. Mullerian mimicry, Mullerian mimicry has two L's and I think stinger, stinger. And that's when a bee and a wasp are both what color? Black and yellow. They both have stingers and they're trying to increase the learning curve by, by being the same color. What is it called if you live in a jungle but you're bright, bright red? What, what, would you, what would you be doing if you're bright, bright red in a jungle? Yes. No, not Batesian or Malarian, something else. Yes. Not count, you're bright red, you stand out, yes. You're poisonous, what do you call that? Yes. Warning coloration. You want people to know that you're there because you are poisonous and you want them to um, not eat you, and you're, you're advertising yourself as being bad, as being distasteful. That's warning coloration. Right? Um, and then we talked about symbiotic relationships. So it's always good for one. What do you call it when it's good for both? Mutualistic. And what was an example of mutualism that we saw? Space 
the cleaning relationships. Remember that? I show like something cleaning out the inside of a mouth of like, a, okay? So you like have a bird on the back of a zebra and so it's cleaning the bugs off of it. That would be mutualistic. What is this one? What would we call that relationship? Parasitic relationship. Okay. And in that one, what would be an example of a parasitic relationship? Yes. Take on a dog, or the old man, we couldn't remember. And then what's this one? Commensalistic. And that's where it's good for one, and the other one doesn't hurt him, it doesn't, it's not bad for him. What was the example we looked at for that? Do you remember? It was epiphytes on trees. And epiphytes, they are plants that grow on other plants up high in the canopy. It doesn't hurt the tree that they're on, but it's good for them because they get the sunlight that they need. All right? That right there is everything in chapter 33. Oh, disturbance. Let's talk about that. Um, when you have ecological succession, when you might start as a meadow and then a more grassy meadow and then you have small shrubs and then bigger shrubs and then all the way to trees, right? And then you have these tall, tall trees. That's your climax community. We learn that it's good every once in a while to have, if it's naturally done, to have a forest, what? Fire, right? A little bit of disturbance will help out. You don't want a lot of disturbance, and you don't want it too frequent, but you want to have a moderate amount of disturbance every once in a while. It kind of cleans out the underbrush and the understory. You don't want to have a fire every year in Yosemite, but every once in a while it's okay because it helps overall with the biodiversity. Okay, now, you have some group shared notes. You might want to find where you titled these group shared notes chapter 33 right now and make a few notes for yourself what you know you need to study in chapter 33 right now. Take some closure. Take about 30 seconds to write yourself a comment on your chapter 33 notes like I would say, Winnie needs to review, and I'd make a little comment off to the side so I know, boy, this, when she talked about that, I didn't know. Don't write everything. That's like highlighting everything. It doesn't do anything. You can do that at home right now, too. Which of those things do you need to review? Or you could go make yourself a piece of toast. All right, you ready? Tell your bio buddy that you're sitting next to right this moment. What is it that you need to review in that chapter? Don't say everything. <laughs> Warning coloration? Oh, sorry. When it's a red frog. Warning like, coloration. Let's say it's not poisonous or something. Is that then it would be a bait sand mimic. Okay, if it okay. mimics something that is brightly colored and it's not brightly colored, then, I mean, sorry, that doesn't make any sense. If it mimics something that's brightly colored, even though it's tasteful, mm -hmm. that would be bait sand. But when I, that wasn't what I was referring to when okay. I first brought it up. It's actually poisonous. Yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. Okay, any other questions on chapter 33? Yes. Will he, if there's like a diagram or a picture of like exponential growth and logistic growth, will we be able to know how to recognize it? Like, you know yes, you should. And this is how you would recognize it. A J-shaped curve versus an S-shaped curve. Yes. What else? I could even ask you to do that as part of your test. Diagram for me a J-shaped growth curve. Or I might say diagram for me an exponential growth curve. What do these two have in common? Tell me out loud. They both what? 
They both have a logistic par part, right? They have a lag and they both have a logistic part to their curve. Okay, what else? Chapter 33 questions. We ready to move on? Okay, chapter 34. Okay, this one is probably easier, right? I think when you think about it. We have uh, all the energy comes from the sun. Who takes that energy from the sun? Autotrophs. Autotrophs, good. What's another name for autotrophs? Producers, good. Okay, where does that energy go to? To what? Consumers? Here's my attempt at a bunny again. That's terrible. Okay, so we call this a primary consumer. What's another name for him? Heterotroph, give me another name. Herbivore. Okay, then where does that go to? Okay, what do we call him? Secondary consumer. What else do we call him? Carnivore. What else do we call him? Carnivore. What else? Heterotroph. What's another name for what I've drawn right here? Food chain. This would be a food chain. If I have this bunny going to something else, Okay. I, I don't know where I was going there. Okay. If I have it going to something else, multiple places, then it would be a food what? Web. What trophic level is this right here? First trophic level. And this is the second trophic. And this would be at the third trophic level. Um, also, what kind of food chain is this? that I've drawn. Yes, this is a grazing because it starts with what? Yeah, but if we had detritivores, here's some worms. You can't even tell that. That's terrible. Look it, there's worms. They're eating the rabbit poo. Okay, then we would call that a what? Detrital food chain. Remember that? Okay. Um, producers, consumer, oh, who works on all of these guys? Decomposers, okay? Decomposers. Okay, so energy flows and chemicals cycle. Cycle, okay, good. And then um, food chains, food web, trophic levels, we did that. Then that brings us to the biogeochemical cycles. I would know them, okay? I would know at least one or two. Water cycle is pretty easy. What's the water cycle you would want to know? Well, I mean, tr evaporation, transpiration, precipitation. Underground water is aquifers. Good. Water cycle good? Oh, what happens if we remove the water from the aquifer? You could get a sinkhole. Good. Okay, next, uh, phosphorus. Phosphates are stored where? In rocks. In rocks. What brings them out of the rocks? Weathering. That's the natural way. It's called a limiting factor, right? Because normally phosphates are kept in check. There's not enough of them, so you don't get an algal bloom. But remember we talked about every one of these cycles, we want to talk about how man screws them up. Like what does man do to the water cycle? Man will what it? Polluted. Okay. What will happen to the phosphorus cycle? Man will add in excessive phosphates. It could be runoff from dairy farms. It could be from chemical waste. It could be runoff from homes. It could be through factory waste. And we add soaps. We add in excessive phosphates and we get an algal bloom. What is that called? Eutrophication. And that ultimately kills off fish and bodies of water, right? Okay, shh. 
fish in bodies of water because you get all this algae where you would go, yay, producers, but then those producers die, and who works on them? Decomposers, okay? Every heterotroph consumes nutrients and produces CO2, right? Heterotrophs are gonna produce carbon dioxide, and they're gonna consume oxygen. And so when those decomposers work on that, all that dead material, they'll suck all the oxygen out of the lake, and then the fish, what? Die. Good. Water phosphorus, we'll do nitrogen last. Carbon cycle. What's the only thing that removes CO2 out of the air? Plants. Through what process? Photosynthesis. What generates CO2 and puts it in the air? Cellular respiration, which includes decomposers, and what else? Burning of fossil fuels, which we can then pollute the air, and um, what else do I want? I think that's good, yeah. Okay, so that most, most things will put CO2 in the air, we wanna take it out. Let's do the nitrogen cycle. Where's the nitrogen reservoir? In the air, and we do what? Nitrogen fixation, forming what? Ammonia, who does that? Who does nitrogen fixation? Bacteria. Then you do nitrification, first nitrite, NO2 minus, then nitrate, NO3 minus. Who do you serve the nitrate to? Plants, and then animals eat the plants, so it's in the living biotic system. Then the animals and the plants can die. Who works on them? Decomposers back into ammonia. Then you can do nitrification, where you take ammonia and make nitrite. Then you can take nitrite and make nitrate through nitrification. If I want to return it, I do denitrification. Now there's another way to get nitrate. What's one, what's one of those ways? Atmospheric fixation or industrial fixation will also make nitrate. We tend to make too many nitrates, right? And then we get acid rain, okay, and smog. Perfect. Are you good on that? Questions, concerns? Because see, I made this too, because I want to practice chi-square. All right, now. Chapter 32, behavior. We talked about nature versus nurture. Nature means it's in your genes, it's in your DNA. And we had experiments to support that. Name an experiment that supported the, that it's in our DNA. Yes? The twin studies. The twin studies. Name another one. Yes? Hybrids of what? The lovebirds, exactly. With the intermediate length. Yes? The snake. The snakes and tongue flips, right? And whether they like slugs. Um, we looked at the FOSS gene, right? And whether the rat would mother or ma mouse would mother her children or not. We looked at a plissia laying eggs and they got the hormones. So those were all saying our behaviors in our DNA. Then learning, we looked at all kinds of learning, right? We started with fixed action patterns, where something in the environment triggers a fixed action pattern. So if you have that trigger, it triggers that series of behaviors, like a um, baby bird pecking on its mom's beak to get food. But they can get better at it over time. Um, we looked at imprinting as a type of learning, that there's a certain time when a bird could learn their parents what? Song. We might have talked about olfactory imprinting smell with salmon. Salmon will smell their way back to their home stream that they hatched in. When man pollutes the water, they can't smell their way back to their home stream. Even the, so that would be olfactory imprinting. We talked about when baby goslings hatch, the first thing that wags in front of their face, they say, oh, that is the parent. And then they follow that parent wherever it goes. Remember we looked at Lorenz with his gosling? That is all learning. And imprinting is when it, sorry, it happens at a specific sensitive period. Associative learning. We looked at two things. We looked at classical conditioning, right? And that was Pavlov's dog. Do you remember what happened with Pavlov's dog? What would he do? Or what would the dog do? Yes. He would start salivating when he heard a bell. Because normally you could just bring the food in, right? And if you brought the food into a dog and he got to look at the food for a little bit, he'd start salivating. 
But Pavlov started ringing the bell before he brought the food in. It's like before you take your dog for a walk, first you have to go and get the leash. So they can see you going to get the leash. They already know eventually a walk is coming. If she goes to that closet, a leash will come out, a leash will go on me, and we're going outside. Okay? So that would be class classical conditioning. What was our other type? There was classical versus, did I write it up here? Versus opera, and that was with Skinner. And this is when the treat or the punishment came after the behavior. If you clean your room, you get your allowance, right? If you back talk me, you get time out, okay? Except with rats, you would either give them food pellets for a reward or a shock um, if they did the wrong thing. That was cla classical versus operant conditioning. Both of those are associative learning. You're connecting one thing with another is associative learning. Okay, then we talked about mating behavior. And um, within mating behavior, we talked about female choice, and we said females, there were two hypotheses about females. One was good gene, right? Good gene hypothesis, what was the other one? Runaway, runaway hypothesis. So runaway is when you're a, what would be a good example of, of um, runaway hypothesis? When you are a what? Peacock, yeah. And that's all about the what? Looks, yeah. How, and then a, a female would choose a male based on its looks. Whereas good gene is you're looking, are they what? Strong, yeah. Remember we looked at the bower birds and the dancing and the calls and like, look at me, look at me. Okay, we talked about how males can develop a territory that they defend and they can defend it in several different ways. Sexual dimorphism, it was a highlighter for a minute, that is where you can tell the difference between males and females. In the bird world, who tends to be prettier? Males, because they're the ones doing the dances and trying to bring the women in, right? Whereas the females are trying to blend in because they're the ones laying the eggs and probably need to hide. Um, fitness, what is fitness? How do we measure an organism's fitness? By, yeah, their reproductive success. And from that, we looked at sociobiology and specifically altruism. Altruism is where you're saying, I sacrifice myself just completely with no benefit in mind. I'm sacrificing myself to save another. I don't know you, you're a stranger, there's no benefit at all. Does altruism probably exist? No. There's something you're going to get from it. There's what's called reciprocal altruism, which means I'll scratch your back if you scratch mine. I will regurgitate some blood for you, vampire bat, if you what? Regurgitate some blood for me when I need it. What's another one where we looked at the meerkat standing up on the rock screaming and you thought, oh my gosh, they're the ones that are gonna get eaten first. Why would you do that? Why would you stand on the rock and scream? Why? Tell me. Yeah, they have offspring down below. That's pin selection. They're worried that they're, they're protecting their line, which supports their fitness. Okay, and last but not least, we talked about communication. Auditory is what? Sound. Day, night, or both? So this is both, and it's also very fast, right? Visual is what? Mostly day, and it could be fast. What is tactile? Touch. It could be what? Both. Yeah. And what was the classic tactile one? Bee dance, right? And remember in the bee dance, when it waggled, the direction of the waggle told you when you fly out of the hive, the sun would be assumed to be on the straight line, would be the sun if you went right up the hive. But if you go at this angle over here, that means when you go outside, fly to this angle of the sun. And the number of waggles conveys the what? Distance, good job. And then chemical would be like a pheromone, and that works day and night, but it's more, it's what? Slow, slow, okay? Are you highlighting? Are you making notes to yourself on what you need to review? Making comments? Um, so before, let's finish up here on a chi-square test. 
Okay, so now I made a three chamber choice chamber instead of a two chamber choice chamber like you did. Okay, and initially, any guesses how many um, roly polies I put in each chamber there? 10. Oh, let me do a different color. 10 in each chamber. Okay, this is sugar water, this is vinegar water, and this is plain water. This water would be my like control, right? You okay with that? Okay, and when I'm done, it looks like how many are in the vinegar? Zero, zero. How many are in the water? Five. So how many must be here? 25. You don't need to count them. So when we do it, I will give you the equation. Chi squared equals the sum of the observed minus the expected squared over the expected. Do you agree with me on that? Okay, work it out, and then I'll do it with you. Work it out, and then I'll do it with you. When we observed 25, observed minus what? Expected. We expected 10. What's 25 minus 10? 15 squared over what we, over what? Expected, which is 10. Okay. Plus, if we do observed, oops, sorry, observed minus expected, what is that going to give us? Minus. 5 squared over 10 plus observed 0 minus expected. We expected 10. That's minus 10 squared over what we expected 10. So you would take 15 squared over 10 plus 5 squared over 10 plus 10 squared over 10. I wonder what that's going to be. Okay, And you would add up all those numbers together. How many choices did we have? 3. So how many degrees of freedom would we have? Two. Two. And we would go over on our chart, and we would be concerned if it would happen, right, less than 5% of the time. I think that's going to be a pretty big number. What do you think? Yeah. I think that's a pretty big number. So that would say, oh, we said it didn't make a difference. We said we expected it to stay 10, 10, and 10. Did it stay 10, 10, and 10? Mm -hmm. No. In fact, that deviation is so big, then possibly what's in the water makes a difference. Okay, questions or concerns on how to do the chi-square test? I will give you the formula and I will give you the table on how to do that. Okay, I will give you the formula and I will give you the table on that. Did somebody do the math on that? 35. 35? That sounds like a pretty big number to me. Okay, if you do that and it's 35, that's definitely, if you're going to get out a chi-square chart, that's definitely more than what, it, what is acceptable at 5%. Okay, questions, concerns? Okay, at this point, what would I do? What would I study? Okay, what do you think are some important things to study? Yes, group shared notes, what else? Quizzes. Yes, do the quizzes. Back of the chapter, what else? Additional objectives. What else? The vocab. 
Anything else? Ed puzzles. You could go back and do the Ed puzzles. Guys, listen to me. Stop, please. You've waited this long. I made it two columns like this because this is input study and this is output. If you only do one, right? If you could only do one, I would do the output. If you have time, do some input before your output. But output study is the most critical because that's when you practice doing the problem. Do you hear me on that? If you can only do one, do the output. If you can review a little bit on your weaker chapter and then take the quiz at the end of the chapter, that's what I would do. Look over your review notes, take it like a test in testing scenarios, right? Time yourself to put yourself under pressure. You got this. You're very smart. Have a piece of toast.